I will find Luke chapter 2, uh, Luke chapter 2 this morning. Remind you, Wednesday night we're going to be meeting over in the chapel. And I already told the guys this morning, I think we're going to fill it up. So uh, we're going to have the student center set up as overflow uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to do a little something different about 515. We're going to do some fellowship and refreshments over in the student center. And we'll have this parking uh, area open here too. You can walk across the crossway and get there or park on the other side of the road. So I hope you'll keep that in mind. It's always a special time. I was going to preach, uh, are you prepared for Christmas? And maybe that'll save till next year. But I will say this, the Bible does talk about a man by the name of Simeon. And God told him that he wouldn't die until he'd seen the Lord's Christ. And Simeon did not die until he saw baby Jesus there in the temple when he was eight days old. And then Simeon said, now thy servant can depart in peace. Let me just say this. You're getting prepared for Christmas tomorrow. But I want to tell you, friend, you better be prepared for Christmas tomorrow. In eternity that king that came back in fact somebody called it Christmas phase two he came the first time to a manger he's coming back again riding a white stallion and uh, with a sword coming out of his mouth which is the Word of God and on his vesture to be written King of Kings and Lord of Lords what a day that'll be amen Many of you men, or maybe some of you men, maybe you're not like your pastor. Somebody asked me, they've always heard that I'm a last-minute shopper. I hope Shirley took care of it this year. <laughs> How many of you men are like that, to be honest, this morning? All right. Don't be like the one guy, and it was Christmas Eve, and he hadn't gotten anything for his wife yet, so he ran out a little anxious he was a little tight, not like you guys, but he, he was a little tight with his money, and he couldn't decide what to get her. And so he went to a very uh, fancy department store, and he asked the clerk, I want to buy some real special perfume for my wife. And he showed her a bottle, and he said, how much is it? She said, $250. He said, that's too expensive. So she went and got another bottle and set it before him. And he said, how much is that bottle? She said, it's $100. He said, that's too expensive. He came out with another bottle for 10 bucks, And uh, he said, how much is it? And she said, 10 bucks." He said, that's still too expensive. He said, I want to see something really cheap. So she gave him a mirror to look at. <laughs> None of you guys here would be like that, I am sure. And I may have to cough a time or two. This old flu, man, I've been over it two weeks, and the cough dislikes me. So uh, I ask you to pray for me. And the Bible said in Luke 2, verse 1, you know this passage well. It came to pass in those days that were not a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused, his engaged wife, who was already great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I have uh, watched a few Christmas movies. My wife told me the other day, said, uh, uh, I don't want to watch any more Christmas movies. I believe I've seen enough of them. But uh, a couple of my all-time favorites, you know what they are? Home Alone, that's exactly right. 
That little boy was sharp, found himself alone in a couple of those uh, series. And then uh, when he found himself alone, he began to make preparations for what might take place. I want you to know that God was making preparations for what was about to take place. Now, I may be talking to somebody by technology or in the building. I've told you this before. If you're going to be home alone by yourself, please let us know. We'll try to connect you with a family. Now, I've not had any takers yet, but I promise you there'll be folks who'll be out there tomorrow all by themselves, and some of them for all kinds of, of reasons why they're alone. Sometimes they're alone by things that they can't control. Some are alone by things that they can control. A man uh, somehow stumbled onto my front porch yesterday, and uh, I began to hear his story, and I've heard the story a thousand times. Uh, it's just about the same in, in every situation. Uh, and I listened to that story, and part true and part untrue. But today, that, that guy's, uh, he's alone unless something happened, unless he called a family member that he could uh, spend some time with. He's going to be all alone. Sometimes folks said they go to the airport and they observe and there's all kinds of pictures there. They're middle-aged uh, men and women who are saying uh, goodbye to aging parents, wondering if this will be the last opportunity they get to share together. They're service men and women who are, are leaving and going to the other side of the globe, and their family members there that are weeping that they're being left behind. But somebody said one of the saddest pictures at the airport is probably seeing parents saying goodbye to children as they board the plane to go back to the other side of the family. And there are men and women alone this time of year, but there are a lot of boys and girls that are going to be alone this time of year. And buddy, how our heart needs to go out to those boys and girls. And moms and dads, you think very, very hard not only about listen you can't do anything about where you're at but i'm talking if you're not there yet you listen to me you think about the ramifications and the effects down the road 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years hello now i'm preaching whether you're paying attention or not and you be careful about those decisions that you make loneliness is a uh, one of the most desolate, uh, somebody said, desolate words in the human language. It, it can hurl the heaviest weights that a heart will ever be able to endure. And I told you a few weeks ago, Elvis Presley said, are you lonely tonight? Marilyn Monroe, even with all her fame and fortune, never could find satisfaction. Albert Einstein said, it is strange to be known so universally, yet to be so lonely. I talked to a man at the funeral home, and he said, I, I just feel so alone. Do you ever fear being alone? And the good news is, listen to me, you don't have to be alone because the Bible says he's God with us. And you may not be able to feel him or taste him or touch him, but you go ahead and claim he's there. How do you know, preacher? Because he says he was. Now notice with me in verse 1 through 3 the, de the decree that was made. Heaven had already planned for things to take place and had got heaven prepared and earth prepared. God's never without a plan, not knowing what to do. God knows what he's going to do. Remember in Home Alone, that little boy, and I don't know how he got them plans together that fast, but he had them all drawn out, exactly what he was going to do at every door and every window. I, I mean, he had it 
figured out. Why don't you know God had it figured out? God already had it planned. Number one, that decree was from a person. His name was Caesar Augustus. He ruled so much of the known civilization that our text calls his empire all of the world. He was a proud, arrogant person. His name means exalted, something uh, and somebody with dignity and grandeur. He, he wanted to be viewed by God, by the people. They didn't, he didn't want them to know about this Jesus. He wanted to be God, and he's not the first nor the last ruler This act in such a blasphemous way. There are many rulers today that want to be considered as God. So there's not only the person who gave it, there's the place that he gave it to, to the whole world. At this time, Mary and Joseph were very obscure. And the world's media didn't know who they were, but God had a plan and the angels knew who they were were to the world they had little matter of importance but God's got plans for Mary and for Joseph now they've got to hey they've got the possibility of saying no to the Lord Mary didn't have to be the mother of Christ Joseph didn't have to be that earthly father although he didn't have an earthly father they could have said no but aren't you glad they said yes you know God's got a plan and a purpose for your life as well Number one is to be saved. Number two is, is to be sold out in serving Him. And this decree was given for a purpose. It was a census of the people or a taxing or a registering of everybody. It literally means the inscription on an official register of the name, age, profession, and fortune of each head of the family and the number of the children that they have in order to be assessed for their taxes. Had a roll call, you might say. I, I thought about that, and I thought about uh, that old song, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. You know, one of these days, there's going to be a roll call in heaven. One, one of these days, I don't know how he's going to do it. Miss Vicky sings that song, talking about him going through the alphabet. When he finally comes to my name, I'm going to stand up, raise my hand, and shout loud and clear, I'm here. Amen? Amen. I wonder if the roll was called up yonder today, is your name on the roll? If your name's not in the Lamb's book of life, you're going to be left behind. There was a decree that was given, but in verse 4 and 5, there was a decision that was made. Look at verse 4. So Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because it was a house in the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. Think about the inconvenience for Mary and Joseph. Normally, the man would take the trip all by himself, especially in Mary's condition. Why, no doctor, if they'd consulted with a doctor, would agree for her this late in her pregnancy to ride on a donkey for 70 miles. They'd have to ride or walk. The terrain was not smooth like our roads today. It was hilly and bumpy and full of potholes. So it was inconvenient. Could I say sometimes when God wants you to do something, it may not be convenient. But I see the insight. Mary went because she knew something nobody else knew. When they got there, there were at least 10,000, probably more people there as well, and they were all trying to get a place to stay and the innkeeper said, I'm sorry, there is no room. And that's been used over and over, and adequately so, because not only did the innkeeper not have room, but don't be too hard on him. The, the place was full. At least 
He gave them a, a stable for the baby to be born in. But many of you today that are listening to me, the Lord Jesus says, not at your heart's door wanting to get in. He's done it through crisis. He's done it through good times. The Bible said it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Why, everybody here today would have to say, God's been good to us. You're here this morning, aren't you? You're not out there estranged out there with, with no family and, and no place to go. I mean, God's been good to you. But friend, listen to me. The most important thing is you've got to make room in your heart for Jesus. So that brings me to the third thing. That's the delivery. Look at verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished. What does that mean? Galatians 4, 4 says, In the fullness of time, on God's clock, on, on God's timepiece, when the fullness of time w- was come, God sent forth his son. When everything got just right, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Not a moment too soon, not a moment too late, but he was right on time. Now, you hear me? God's getting ready to do something else. Christmas phase two is getting ready to take place. And at the exact moment, not too soon and not too late, I listened to Dr. Adrian Rogers yesterday preaching a sermon, and he talked about the men of God that have preceded him and all the great men of God that you and I might talk about and how all of them have talked about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Adrian fully believed in his day that he was going to hear that trumpet sound and see Jesus step out on the cloud. If Adrian thought his coming was that close, how much closer is his coming today? Oh, the timing. It speaks of certainty. The Scripture says, so it was. It didn't look good a few weeks before Christmas that the birth would take place in Bethlehem while Mary and Joseph, they're nowhere around. Didn't look like it was going to happen according to Micah chapter 5. But you hear me circumstances uh, don't bother God and they don't hinder God because God's got a plan. And His plan's going to be fulfilled and accomplished whether you and I agree with it and get on board or not, God's will is going to be done. Sometimes God lets circumstances become great in order to show the greatness of His power in overcoming them. Well, friend, just look at you and me, how desperately you and I were for God. And if God can save a wretch like you and me, God can save anybody. So don't sit there and think, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, they're too far gone. Not if they're still breathing, they're not. They'll give God a chance. My Bible says, whosoever will, may come speaks of certainty so it was listen if you don't believe in the virgin birth you got some problems you got some problems number one with the lord jesus christ you got some problems with the word of god hello you got some problems with eternity you can't be saved if you don't believe in the virgin birth amen Speaks of compliance. So it was that there. You see, it matters that you're there. We've talked about that a lot of times. The there in your life is where God wants you to be because God's got something for you there. Remember Elijah in 1 Kings? He was told by God to go down to Brook Cherith, and it was there that the ravens would feed him and to go down to Zidon, and there the widow woman would feed him. It really matters that you're there. I remember one week a time back when two men, for some reason that week, gave me their testimonies. One said, 
It was just an invitation to church. Somebody had asked me to play ball on the church ball team. And then I went to the service. I went to the service and I heard some songs and I heard a sermon about how to have eternal life. And it was there when I heard that I could have eternal life that I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. But it started with an invitation to play ball. The other testimony was a man who loved to party. He got invited to a men's Bible study. At first he didn't want to go, but then he heard there were some refreshments and might be some girls there. Hello. So he went and there he heard the gospel. And there he gave his heart and life to the Lord Jesus. Now hear me. God brought you here today because this is your there. And whatever your situation, whatever your circumstances, God wants to meet you here or you're there. Then it speaks of completion. And the days were accomplished. It happened just like Jesus said, it's going to happen. Could I tell you, friend, it's going to happen just like Jesus said it's going to happen. One day, the Bible said, in an hour when you think not, the Son of Man cometh. The Bible said uh, in the book of Matthew, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. You know what that's symbolic of? You know what that's talking about? The bridegroom is on his way. That's the Lord Jesus. Go ye out to meet him. That's the bride. That's those who make up the body of the church of the Lord Jesus. And the only way you get saved, oh, you can join, by Rock, you can join Rock Springs by walking an aisle and, and just saying, I want to be a member of this church. But you can't join the bride of Christ unless you get saved. So it speaks of completeness. There's the testimony of it. Talks about the person, the firstborn son, the, the virgin birth. The greatest birth in history is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. No other birth like the birth of Jesus. Then it speaks of that place. Now listen carefully. There in a manger. There's the character of that manger. Oh, it's not a pretty little thing like we see in some of our Christmas plays. It's a feeding trough. It's dirty. The animals that have eaten out of there probably smells. But that's where they laid baby Jesus. The contradiction of it, we just sang... He's the king. It's a contradiction in that stable, in that cow trough for a king to be placed. But not only a contradiction to his person, but his position. This world has yet to give Jesus his rightful place. But one day, ever kneel bow and ever tone and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a contradiction to his power. <coughs> One day, it'll all be settled. But not always the character of it, the contradiction of it, there's the cause of it. No room. People are everywhere. People's lives are so full of themselves. They've got so many things that they've got planned and they make no room for Jesus. And their life is lived and it's gone and they recognize they've left Christ out. Simeon said, I'm now ready to die because I've seen the Lord's Christ. And folks, you're not ready to die until you meet Jesus. In fact, you're not ready to live until you meet Jesus. 
we preach about no room for Jesus, and that's true. But there are people everywhere around Christ in that time that made no room for Him. And when you embrace Christ, and when you serve Him, the world will exclude you as well. You'll not be invited to some parties. You'll not be invited to some positions. If you're a sold-out believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this world's got less room for Jesus than they ever have. Now, the enemy's going to do everything he can to keep you home alone. He don't want you saved. He don't want you claiming that verse, Emmanuel. The devil's going to do everything he can to prevent you from being what God's designed you to be. He's the greatest thief of all time. He's stealing lives and hearts every day. He's the biggest liar that ever lived. He wants to steal your hearts. And if he can get your heart, then he's got the rest. It's one thing to have Jesus in your head, and you need to hear, and you need to believe, but you've got to receive the Lord Jesus. He's after your heart, and if he's got your heart, he'll get the rest. He wants your head. He wants your mind. And boys and girls, that's why it's so important, and moms and dads, it's so important. They hear the truth as boys and girls because we're living in a day when the devil is trying to rob the minds of boys and girls from hearing and believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And once they get to a certain age, it's very, very difficult for them to believe the simple gospel of a virgin birth and a virtuous life and a vicarious death and a victorious resurrection. Well, he's after your head, and then he wants your hands. He wants you to be busy doing the wrong things, and then he wants to steal your home. Now, you listen to me, every home in this building right now, every home in this building, I, I can't tell you all the story, but this morning, I got a text. I got a text, and it was about a church leader far, far away from here. A church leader and leading in several positions in the church, but evidently was leading a secret life. And it got caught up with him. And today, all the lies the devil told him, all the things that he has stolen away from that man, you know what the devil's doing? He's not hugging him this morning. He's laughing at that man. And he's saying, you're a fool. You're a fool to follow me. And oh, we need to pray for that man. But the damage that he has caused, so here your pastor the time to stop the devil is right now. Whatever he's putting in your head that's not godly, whatever he's trying to get you to do that's not right, today is time to, to stop him and let Jesus be the Lord of every part of your life. He'll promise you everything and leave you with nothing and take you to hell where you'll be alone forever and forever. Here's the good news. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll go with you every step of the way. You don't have to be a, alone today or, or tomorrow. Jesus is waiting for redemption for some of you. Why? You need to give your heart and life to Christ. For some of you today, you need to return. You need to come back home. Boy, what a blessed sight at that airport as well, when you see boys and girls and men and women coming back home, what a, what a blessed sight in the church when you see folks who come home who may have wandered far from God. And by the way, you don't have to confess to a preacher. You don't have to confess to anybody else. Just come and do business with God. But today... You need to come home. For others, it's recognition 
The enemy's working overtime in your life, and he wants your soul and your family and your life. And you need to tell the devil, listen to me, take a hike. You're not wanted in my life. You're not wanted in my family. You're not wanted. And as first Sarge used to tell us, when the devil began to give him a fit riding down the road, now, buddy, you, you, you would think he is a bona fide nut. Stop in the middle of the road, went around and opened the door and said, Devil, get out of my car. Well, friend, you may have to symbolically do that today and tell the devil he's not welcome in your life. He's not welcome in your home. Jesus lives there. Maybe here today you feel abandoned by family and friends. But whoever you are, Jesus said you don't have to be alone because I came into this world seeking to save that which was lost. I wonder if there's anybody in this building today or anybody listening to me by technology today that would dare to, to pray a simple prayer something like this lord jesus i don't want to be alone i know i need to be saved and i know my life needs to be changed and i believe you were born of a virgin in bethlehem and i believe you died on an old rugged cross to take away my sin and by faith that means you believe it By faith, I open my heart, and I invite you to come in today and to save my soul, Jesus. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You're in this building today, up there in the balcony, in the gallery on the main floor. Did you pray that prayer? If you did, I'm, I'm going to beckon you to leave from where you are. Get up out of that pew and walk down this aisle. There'll be some men at the end of these aisles that'll want to talk with you.